to get everything in order. Okay, I am going to stop that. You can probably tell from the sound on my laptop that uh, my CPU fan is whirring and it's about to go a lot more. Uh, share screen. I'm going to do that. Okay. Um, so hopefully you can see uh, the title slide. Um, and basically, uh, this is part two of a two-part article series, uh, article, two-part talk series about me having second thoughts on how to handle asynchronous I.O. Um, smack in the middle of trying to implement a, a port based home computer. Um, and uh, so why do I even care about asynchronous IO? Well, um, I want to have interactive keyboard and mouse input while at the same time um, accessing uh, storage device in the background. Um, and the reason for that is related to uh, my experience with SD cards where um, where leveling uh, a feature of, that's built into all SD cards uh, will eventually cause um, very long delays. In my experience with the, with the Kestrel 2, um, those delays often got up to in the minutes um, where it was basically, the computer was basically inoperable and it, it appeared to be deadlocked. Uh, for 45 seconds to almost 60 seconds because the SD card was just uh, shuffling blocks around. Um, and in the meantime, the computer was just waiting and waiting and waiting. Are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? And of course it, it um, led to a very poor user experience. So for this computer design, I want to attempt to mitigate that by at least having, if nothing else, the ability to ask the computer interactively, "Hey, what's your status?" and it, you know, and if it could come up with, you know, a message saying, "Hey, I'm still waiting for the SD card," then at least I know that the computer itself didn't crash. And there's more practical reasons as well. I mean, you can see in the example here, um, you can be using a CAD program and where your keyboard and mouse input are work together um, while you're saving on due information to SD card in the background, right? So this is. Um, it, it is, uh, it has a wide range of applications. Uh, however, I ran into a certain um, uh, second thoughts while I was attempting to implement my, my basic design. Um, basically, I wanted something that was moderately flexible across both threads and processes. Um, and I wanted it to have a better abstraction than what I came up with um, at the time. The, the problem with what I came up with at the time was I felt that it exposed too much uh, to the programmer and um, uh, led the interface to be very fragile. So I decided to start looking at historical precedent and there are uh, some precedents in for it, one of which is key, um, which is a lovely query word, um, which really is kind of the prototype for how asynchronous operations happen in for typically. Um, so if you have an, uh, an IO channel of some sort uh, and you want to um, uh, know that you can still continue running afterwards, there's very often a query word, which is the same name as the word, but with a question mark after it. The idea is if the query word returns true, then you know that the action word, the corresponding action word um, will respond immediately rather that be sending something out of out to the to the port rather it be inputting data however that works it's it's kind of behind this uh, uh, behind the curtains a little bit but that's the general flow that that's seems to be the the fourthy way of um, of doing this um, so here's an example uh, it, it does definitely support asynchronous keyboard input if you use it in a centralized event loop and I actually uh, one of my video games uh, called Equilibrium, which is which I've done way back in the day. Oh goodness, 2007-ish uh, thereabouts. Um, uh, basically, is built this way. Basically, I have an event loop, and inside it, I 
basically ask for a key, and if so, then handle the key, right? Um, and there are several uh, uh, applications of that. Now, with the fourth box, which is my homebrew, my next generation homebrew computer, if you want to call it that, um, all the I.O. is intended to be under a single model, conceptual model, and that model is based on the 9P protocol. So I figured, well, um, how would we handle or integrate 9P into this so that I can still maintain, um, you know, interactivity? And this is kind of the thought process that I initially came up with. Sorry, the second thought process that I initially came up with. I'll talk. I've already discussed the first, which was kind of the the uh, the, uh, the device driver and, and message queuing system that I came, that I illustrated last month. Um, so this is the second one that I was coming up with, and that was what? Why don't I just replicate what already is known to work in fourth? And that was having that separation between query and action words. Um, so it should, in theory, work. Um, but the problem is, is that 9P is not a device. We can't just query a device and ask, hey, um, you know, do you have any pending 9P stuff for us, right? Um, because 9P can be routed over anything. It could go over a serial port, it could go over a spy port, it could go over I2C, it could go over TCP IP. <laughs> it, it, it's literally over anything. Um, so how would we, and if we, if I wanted to map a unified IO architecture on top of this, then um, how would we delegate the responsibility of key question mark to something that runs on top of 9P, which is much more asynchronous and event driven. So here's kind of what my current vision of the fourth box kind of looks like at the moment. Um, we have a computer, the actual board itself or boards as the case may be. And then this thick black line here, this represents the single IO channel to which all the peripherals will attach. Um, this channel is going to be based on the uh, SPI interface. Uh, the only real augmentation to it is that it's going to have an interrupt pin um, so that asynchronous feedback uh, to the host can happen. Um, and then my vision is that I'm just going to have two separate microcontroller boards, one for the keyboard and mouse and one for the SD card drive. Um, and so the idea is to, to uh, apply both of these onto the same single bus. But if we do that, and, and basically this is more of a, um, a cost cutting measure as well as a um, breaking the problem apart in a small manageable pieces sort of thing. Um, but if we do this, then how does key question mark work? How does asynchronous disk I.O. work? That sort of thing. Um, because um, now we're all going to be, I don't want to say bottleneck because that's not the right word, but um, uh, there's going to be problems with queuing, uh, you know, uh, uh, queuing, uh, what's the word? Uh, disambiguating feedback from what comes off that port. Because like I can send a command to the keyboard and mouse controller, for example, but the next response I get back could well be from the SD drive. So there has to be some coordination of that. That's, that's what I'm trying to express, right? So there are several solutions um, that have um, historically worked well for fourth systems. One is to make it multi-threading, uh, whether it be cooperative or preemptive, doesn't really matter. But this is the age old classical uh, approach to this problem. The vast majority of fourth systems that Chuck Moore wrote has utilized multi-threading in some capacity up to and including color fourth. Um, the next approach, which was actually what I talked about in the previous uh, talk, is the device driver model, where basically if you want to perform an I.O. operation, you fill out a, um, this block of memory with um, a request and you queue it onto a device driver. And then what, after a while, that device driver will reply to that message and you eventually pick that up uh, at a later time. 
And then finally, the third option, which is probably the most worthy of, of them all, is to punt the problem to the application and let the application deal with it and, and just leave the fourth kernel um, as skeletal as, as possible. Um, so pros and cons on each of these. Um, Multi-threading, uh, we don't strictly need the query words anymore. Uh, and in fact, this is kind of how Plan 9 works, which is where 9P comes from. Um, if you have multiple input streams that you're processing in your program, you basically just spawn uh, a thread to manage that one particular input stream. Uh, and then in the core of your program, you coordinate um, everything and you um, uh, act on the input and output as needed. Um, and it actually works really well if you've ever used Plan 9. Um, they've done an excellent job at maintaining a very responsive system. And applications, when you look at them, don't typically have an event loop. Uh, like there's, it's just all threads. So it's kind of a neat, uh, a neat approach to go. And this appears to be very fourth friendly. Um, pause, of course, uh, causes a task switch, which is trivial to implement. Um, no need for queues. Uh, well, there is a need for queuing, but it's all tucked behind, uh, you know, behind an abstraction. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's no need for publishing um, what a message block looks like, right? You just have this opaque binary blob that represents the task state, and you can do whatever is most convenient uh, for switching tasks. And it, it, it really is quite trivial to implement. A round robin scheduler takes maybe uh, 20 to 30 instructions on a processor, typically. Uh, there are some downsides to this, though. Like, how do we create a thread? There's no established standard word set for that, although there is one around 2018 or so that was proposed. Uh, I don't know if it's still active. Um, I just made some up, uh, some contributions to it um, on the fourthstandard.org website. So I'll probably be pinged to or, or roped into um, completing that spec, but um, I don't know that I have the bandwidth for it, but I'll see what I can do. At any rate, nonetheless, there is no standard for it. And then finally, how does marker words interact with threads? That's a very important thing to consider because according to the fourth standard, marker technically doesn't need to do anything other than clean up the dictionary. Other resources are free to be just kept open or threads running or what have you, this opens up a, um, a great instability uh, to the system because if you execute a marker word to reset the dictionary and there are threads that are still running, the next thing that you compile into the system will probably crash the system uh, because now you're overwriting an active thread uh, that's still, still running. So markers behavior needs to be uh, clarified with that. Okay. Device drivers works great in a single threaded environment, and so therefore we avoid all of these problems. On the other hand, it's not quite forthy, right? Because now you're filling out structures, you're, you're dealing with a lot with global variables. Uh, sometimes you have to juggle a lot of stuff on the stack, and you need a huge number of support words in order to actually make the thing function. You gotta send a message, you gotta receive a message, you gotta um, uh, support canceling messages. You have to be able to identify device drivers symbolically. Um, you know, there's all these things that needs that needs to be solved. And I have come up with a solution for them. I have solved all these problems. This is actually one of the reasons why I went down this road. Um, and so, um, and it does have the advantage of being very high performance. This is something that I forgot to mention before, is that this device driver architecture is often frequently used on hard real-time systems, right? So this is, um, uh, it is a good architecture to use. It's just laborious. And then finally, there's punting the problem to the application, right? This is the simplest possible design that could work because there is no design. This might be considered a case where Chuck Moore is looking at, you know, looking at me from afar and saying, you know, um, solve your, or, or eliminate your non-problems uh, before solving the actual problem, right? Um, so basically we, what the idea here is everything is a synchronous design by default and all of our IO operations like key, emit, accept, et cetera, um, all of these are deferred words. 
And the idea is when we do want asynchronous operation, we can shim it underneath um, you know, the basic system by just redirecting all of these deferred words and then everything magically should, in theory, um, uh, start using the asynchronous code uh, as well. The problem with this now is that the fourth kernel now becomes extremely hardware configuration dependent. Um, if I have, if I go back here, for example, here I've got a single bus, um, but if I add a second bus, for example, and I put the keyboard and mouse on that second bus, I have to recompile everything in order to make sure that the system comes up and realizes where the keyboard and mouse is. is. I can't just, um, you know, auto detect uh, where everything, uh, everything is. Um, Whereas it's much, much easier if I go with the, uh, with the, uh, the device driver model. Um, so there's that. Um, and then finally, applications need to remember to load uh, the asynchrony support um, as a matter of course. They can't just depend on it being there. You have to load it in as an actual library. So which way am I going to go? Honestly, I don't know. Um, I, <laughs> I spent many months thinking about this and I still don't have an answer. Um, so for now, I think it's gonna be the case that I'm gonna punt the issue um, and then gather more experience with a very minimal system before revisiting the problem. So basically I'm still in information collecting mode. Um, a bit anticlimactic, but considering my daily, uh, daily bandwidth and such, um, I think this is probably the most, most viable approach going forward. And that is the end of part two, um, and thus the series of articles that uh, or talks on this topic. Does anyone have any questions? I don't hear any, so. My question is, where's the unmute button? Oh, wait, I found it. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> Sam? Uh, what are the different things that you are using your um, your system for now? Well, it doesn't exist yet. I'm building it. Um, but the future tasks that I plan on using it for include um, a little bit of web serving, um, as well as uh, like just homebrew game development, video game development, as well as uh, printed circuit board layout. Uh, the so main two any... features, functions of SAM system are one, it is a time sink, and two, it is a uh, increaser or decreaser of entropy. Typically increasing. <laughs> Well, we, we know which direction time zero uh, points. So yes, I guess it's much everything in the, in the long run is <laughs> increasing there, there is entropy. There's one other question I have, which is um, uh, Klaus, Klaus had a, uh, a core and he had tests for his core that, um, that he was running to make sure that everything was still working, you know? And I was wondering if you have anything like that. Um, I do use uh, test-driven development techniques in the process of building the software. Um, Excellent. I also am running under a software emulation on my laptop at the moment. Um, it's, it uses a, um, so the fourth box design, I didn't go into the full history of it, but um, the fourth box design uses a 65816 processor, which is a 16-bit variation of the 6502. Um, and the reason I chose that processor instead of something more modern like uh, uh, an FPGA-based system or uh, a RISC-V processor is um, I, I, I initially spec'd out a computer back in 2004 that I built a prototype single board computer on using um, uh, uh, Raider Shack uh, breadboards. And that worked great, um, but I never finished the project. Um, and so 
now that 2024 is just around the corner, basically, I figured, well, it would be great if I could revisit that project and actually finish it, quote unquote, finish it um, by December of 2024 and be able to say, haha, this is the 20th anniversary redesign of something that I built like years and years ago. Um, and so that's kind of where, where my thought process is. And in the process of doing this, um, I, I want to make it as, um, I, I want to make it with, with as good a set of design principles as I can in best practices. Um, so that's, that's why I'm looking into the asynchronous IO and, and stuff. Okay, thank you um, for answering my question and thank you for doing your presentation. I appreciate your presentations. Great, thank you. Yes, me too. And let's have a round of applause for, uh, <laughs> how do we do applause? I guess there's a, a click button. There's a clicky for you clap. Uh, today's t-shirt is the evolution of the modern mechanic. So fourth has evolved over the years. So has the uh, modern mimic. This is from the erstwhile radio program and now twice a week podcast, uh, the best of our talk. So uh, I guess this will be one of these collector's items uh, like the, uh, the uh, Tom Petty uh, t-shirts from his first round on Sirius XM. So, uh, I wanted to ask uh, if anybody uh, noticed the change in schedule. I, I think that we all know that uh, on the meetup page, it says all durations and descriptions are approximate or perhaps entirely insistent with what will eventually transpire. Uh, Brad uh, texted me and said, what's the plan? Uh, plan may be too strong a word, Brad. Uh, I wanted to ask Stephen A to post his uh, email address on the chat so that we can uh, annoy him with uh, various hectoring emails about the possibility of uh, instantiating Klaus's efforts in actual uh, widespread hardware. Uh, so moving on uh, next, uh, since Bill Ragsdale is attending uh, to some obligation with uh, Ham Radio Field Day. I think that's what he said. Uh, Brad will uh, uh, moderate the uh, June challenge. So uh, he's uh, notably, uh, Bill is notably with us in spirit and by delayed videotape, uh, oh, it's an old word that uh, doesn't pertain anymore. He made a recording. So uh, I think uh, Brad will run that. Uh, so Brad, you're on. Brad is still muted. So we'll hear from him shortly as soon as Hello he can, can you can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, the real test will be whether we'll be able to hear Bill and uh, he doesn't, let me start hit play on this and if it does not work, uh, let me know. Shall I phone Bill and ask him to unmute? Oh, well, good morning, Bill Ragsdell here. We're going to do uh, I hear well, part three of the world challenges for the uh, SD Fig here at June 25th, 2022. First, a refresher on the world game. World game took the world by storm starting about last December. On, online, you guess a five letter word. You have six tries to guess that word. You get some hints. A correct letter in the correct position will be shown in green. And the correct letter will be shown in bold. We're building tools now to support the Wordle game. Here's an example. The first guess for this puzzle would be the word ridge. And the fact that we got two gold and a, and a green IDE gives us a start. We then picked the word doggy. We picked up the letter D. That led us to the word diode. 
uh, it had fewer letters, but we see it for I and OR and the J and E at the end. And finally, the word oxide, and it's all green and it matches. So we're building tools to work on the Wordle games. The challenge today is say develop a list of five letter words, 20 or so would start. Uh, in this case, I've used about 2,000, which is from the Wordle list. The world total maximum list is about 12,000 words, all five letter words. From this, we'll form evaluation criteria for the closest between the words. This is kind of like the letter frequencies for the alphabet. Well, in this case, it's the uh, frequency of usage or compatibility between words. And finally, then for each word on the list, we'll rank its closeness with the remaining words. Here's the exact list of Wordle words. Uh, they have two sections. There are about 8,000 words that are eligible to be used, but are unusual or rare words that are not included, and then about 2,300 of the very common English words. This is taken right off of the cache from my computer, and when you're playing a Wordle game, you actually have this list in your computer. Here's an example for the ranking criteria that I developed over the uh, and five letter words, in this case, N is about 2,300, we select a test word. Then for each letter in that test word, we'll compare it to all of the other words on the list, which is N minus one. Every time a letter appears in our test word and the input word, we score three if they're in the same position. If the letters appear simultaneously in both words, but not in the same position, I score a one. A little example at the bottom left, the unknown word is the word stare, and we're testing against toast. So we see that under the T is the number one because T appears one time in the unknown word stare. Under the O is a zero since there's no usage. Under the A is a three because A appears in the third position for both words. Under S, again, it's a match. We have an S. Then we come to the final T. Now T is only used one time in stare, and we've already caught it on the first T in the word, so there would be a zero under the last T. You see, a word can only be scored once. If it appears twice in both words, it will be scored twice. Now we're to the fourth. Let's look at building the uh, uh, files. First, we have a disk file. Uh, it is Wordle daily list.txt, and we see the full path of this in the directory. In this case, I'm using uh, F4, F4, uh, Win32 fourth uh, version, uh, the latest version, and these access words are taken from the NC standard fourth. So, first, we name the disk file into an array. We open the disk and get its file ID. Uh, that is done by the word open file. And it, uh, it, it uh, reports to the word my file ID, which holds the, uh, the uh, FIP ID. That can find the file size. That uses the uh, fourth word file size, uh, obviously. And finally, we copy the disk words to a fourth array. So my file contents is the destination. We know my file size. We know its ID. Read file reads it into my file contents. Now we need to create to count words and create a matrix of the proper size. So I have a totally word that I develop count words. It goes into the file contents. It does a scan by letters, counts the total number of letters, and then um, uh, actually when it looks for the ASCII uh, comma, and the ASCII comma tells it how many words are in the file. Then in the bottom we see we create two thousand three hundred and nine. Uh, uh, times two matrix words. This this is done uh, in uh, the, in the word set. We actually, it's a it's a um, twenty three oh nine by two matrix, two columns of the matrix, and that word the, all the words appear in the word set. The next word for matrix pulls all of the words sequentially from our input buffer into that matrix. It's done this by letter by letter. So there's a couple of uh, values that are used to keep track of where we are. And so over my file contents by file size, we do a do loop. 
the, one of the key words is the query ASCII question mark ASCII. This determines if we have a letter in the range between A and Z. If so, it is added into the matrix in the proper position. On the other hand, if it does not, and it is an ASCII J, we then reset because we've now reached a new word. So sequential, this passes through all 2,309 words, letter by letter. Here's the utility to print out the matrix. Remember, there's two columns. The first column is the word. The second column will be the usage. So we have a do loop that simply scans through the matrix. It goes to the first column and does a print word, which, which prints out a five-letter word, three spaces for formatting. The next line then with a dot with an F dot prints out the floating point value on the scoring. And that simply loops, loops across all 2,300 words. Here's an example that we get then from the very, very start. We've taken word set and formed a matrix. We've taken that same word set and then with the parameter 10, we print the matrix and it will print the uh, first 10 values. So these are in, arranged in a random value in the input set. You see the words like cigar, rebut, sissy, awake, and so on. And at the moment, they're all scored to zero. There's a word that does the scoring. Remember, we have two uh, uh, situations. If the words are uh, in alignment, we score three points. If the letters are not in alignment, but they match in both words, we score one point. So there are two do loops. The first do loop checks with the three point situation. And if that does not occur, it goes down and checks for the uh, 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 one point situation. This is uh, uh, extending the scoring now. The prior uh, uh, word only did one word at a time. This sets up a double do loop to go over all of the words. And so it scans through the list. The first time picking out the unknown word, the second do loop picks the test word. And if you see on about line number five, there's a greater less than sign. This assures that the word will not be tested against itself. In red, we see the uh, bracket score negate. Bracket score is the prior word, scores the particular word against all other words. And negate uh, switch, uh, uh, switches the value to its negative value. This is so the sort will go from the uh, uh, greatest to the smallest value. Normally, the third goes to the smallest to the greatest value. Then down to the bottom, the next to the last word uh, does a conversion to floating point. All of the all the math above is done on the stack as integer arithmetic, and then finally within the matrix, we put down the floating point value. So here's the scoring for one word. And uh, I'll revise you now. Oh, go ahead. Four words. All right. After the scoring, here's what we come up with. The word stare has a compatibility score of 5,388. Mm -hmm. This would be expected. It's the most compatible word with all the rest because S, T, and R are the most common consonants in English, and A and R are the most common vowels. The following words like arose, raise, arise, slate, erase, and so on are all quite similar. Again, they're using these very uh, common vowels, uh, very common consonants, and again, the popular vowels using A, E, or possibly I, or possibly O. If we reverse the sort, we can look down at the low ranked words. Well, the lowest ranked words, the lowest ranked word in the whole list is fuzzy. It only has a score of 1832. Because again, it's using the letters F, Z, Z, which are low usage, and the consonants U and Y, which are low. Another one, very low usage, would be uh, humph, for example. There's only one vowel U in the word. The most difficult word I found in using Wordle in real time has been the word fjord, F J O R D. That one gave me piss. I'm not sure I got it in six letters, uh, in six tries, uh, if at all. So here's the performance. We've seen how we developed the lists from file. We put them into a matrix. We did a double scan on the matrix, stored all the words, 
and we listed the properties both uh, increasing and decreasing. So how did the fourth do in handling this? Over the 2309 words, there was 5.9 million word comparisons made. And within that, during that, through those comparisons, there were a million, uh, 133 million letter comparisons. And this took a total of 24 seconds. This was followed by a, a 2300 item bubble sort, which meant that 2.7 million floating point comparisons were made. That took six seconds. And you can see in this situation, we have 0.45 megaflops uh, execution speed. So there we have it. We've developed a the actual word, word, word set. We found out the best words to use for searching. And we've also gotten a little hint at the kind of words we would not want to search from. So let's look ahead. This is our July challenge. I'm proposing that we take this wordle support another step further. We develop an alphabetic grid such that when an unknown word assesses against a series of known words, as we were doing today, we actually build a grid for that unknown word. The unknown uh, word is held by uh, in the grid by the letters known in their location. If they're known and the proper location, they're they're and green. They're marked in one part of the grid, and if the letter is used but unknown, it's marked in another part of the grid. So the grid has two sections, the uh, known letters and the letters known by exact position. Our purpose on this is to sequentially improve the grid as a model of the unknown word. As we make two or three tests, the grid will get closer and closer in alignment to the actual word. And eventually, of course, it will find the proper word where all six letters match. On the other hand, though, Wordle only allows us six tries. So that means the searching process has to have a little more intelligence about it. And we'll probably work on that intelligence in future challenges. So I'd like to thank you, uh, thank you all. Goodbye, good night, good day, uh, whatever time zone you're in. And uh, this is Bill Ragsdale, and we are now back to Kevin, our fearless leader. Thank you. All right. Um, oops.